the volume of imaging has outpaced the growth of the number of radiologists, and this translates into more work for each radiologist and pressure to put more hours in or to read faster is a potential recipe for burnout. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Radiology Report podcast, where we are having conversations with the leaders transforming radiology today. You can find us on radiologyreportpodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Daniel Arnold. Today, we are joined by Dr. Francis Dang. Dr. Dang is a board-certified radiologist who completed his radiology residency and neuroradiology fellowship at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He is on the neuroradiology faculty at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I'm really excited to have Dr. Dang on, on the show. You know, we, we've had a lot of people on the show who are sort of later in their career. Maybe they've already accomplished a whole lot, but it's really awesome to have you on the show, early academic radiologist, and to share what it's like. You, know, you just finished your first year as an academic radiologist. So what's it like trying to build your career in these early days and you know, speak to those who might be considering a career in academics and also share a little bit more about um, your research and different trends you're seeing in the industry. So uh, Dr. Dang, super excited to have you on the show. Thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Dan. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, how did you find uh, radiology? What drew you to the specialty and ultimately neuro? And what do you find most fulfilling about radiology? Sure. What drew me to radiology when I was a medical student was seeing the command of anatomy and pathology and clinical relevance that radiologists had. When I was a first year medical student in our anatomy lab, we had chief radiology residents pulls aside and teach us the radiologic correlate to whatever anatomy we're dissecting. But then they added all of this extra detail about, okay, so this is what could possibly go wrong with this organ system. And you know this is what it would look like on imaging and all that kind of stuff. And I was mesmerized that they would have such a breadth of knowledge. And what drew me in further as I progressed during medical school was the appeal that everything that I was learning as a preclinical medical student, you know, studying for step one could be relevant for radiology because, you know, I thought that it would be a waste to just throw out all of that knowledge and then just focus on one part of the body or one, one type of pathology for the rest of my training. And it was really the breadth of radiology that kept me mesmerized and kept me curious intellectually about the field. When I got into residency um, and it came down to choosing a subspecialty, the demands kind of changed. I was looking for something that could allow me to add value to the care of patients, right? Sometimes in radiology, we're often seen as being behind the scenes and you can often be forgotten. But when it came down to seeing where radiologists could improve the care of a patient, change management, and add value to the referring clinicians, it was neuroradiology that stood out for me. At first, it was because of head and neck radiology. So my wife is a otolaryngologist and when I came home from neuroradiology rotation and um, I had read some challenging case that's related to the head and neck, I could ask my wife, okay, so what do you guys look for in these cases? What is your decision-making like? And the more I understood about head and neck decision-making, the more I liked head and neck radiology. And that's what drew me into neuroradiology because head and neck is part of neuroradiology. It's not just the brain and the spine, it's also the extracranial head and neck. Super interesting answer. I don't think I've ever heard someone start that answer with their love of anatomy, which uh, <laughs> is is a really special characteristic, but also means you definitely found the right field for you. Is your wife then, is she also at Hopkins? She is. Yeah. She's doing so, a fellowship. So is she, she going to be one of your referring physicians? In the future, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, you're going to have a harsh critic on the other end of those reports. <laughs> that's for sure. So tell us a little bit about your work. You ultimately decided to come to Hopkins, kind of walk us through that decision. What was the process like of, you know, applying to jobs in academia? And, you know, tell us a little bit about what your role is. When I was looking for jobs after fellowship, I was interested in academic places because I knew I wanted to teach and I enjoyed the academic environment that I had trained in. 
And uh, the choice of coming to Hopkins was really driven by my wife, uh, who was looking for a fellowship. Uh, she's doing otology, neurotology fellowship, and they have a great training program at Hopkins. And I thought it was a great match for the both of us because Hopkins is well reputed in radiology as well. What that means in terms of my academic job is that, you know, I'm 80% clinical and 20% time is left up to me to structure in terms of preparing talks, working on research, doing administrative stuff related to, you know, administering some program or mentoring students and what have you. And so that's what I like a lot about academic jobs, because you get a lot of variety in your day-to-day -day experience, because, uh, you know, today I have an academic day, I'll be doing this podcast, I'll be reviewing a paper, I'll be putting finishing touches on a grant. And the next day I'll be doing, you know, clinical work that you could do in private practice. Uh, but, you know, it's also augmented by additional kind of features, I think, of, you know, tertiary academic centers, I'll be presenting at a tumor board, for instance. So, you know, all, all those kinds of things, I, I think, add a lot of variety to uh, my work and uh, keeps it interesting. So your research, you mentioned you're doing a little bit of research. What are you doing research in? What are some of the areas that you're really interested in? So my primary focus as an academic, I think, is as an educator. And to go along with that, I want to do research in education per se. So we are finishing up, for instance, a systematic review on the role of simulation training for radiology residents in learning how to manage adverse contrast reactions. So that's just one example of the type of research that I'm doing. The other type of research that I think people in my kind of track or mold is clinical research, because you want to be able to call yourself an expert in some clinical niche. And that allows you to teach others about it as well. I think what it means to be a clinician educator is like, you're a very good clinician first and foremost, but because be you're so good at it, um, you can also teach others about it as well. So have you carved out an area clinically that you're more interested in teaching and even further specializing in? Yeah, I'm very interested in head and neck radiology, um, as I mentioned, because of that initial interest through my wife and understanding the decision making. But also during residency, I just found that the community of head and neck radiologists was so nice and welcoming and brainy, but also relaxed. Um, and I felt like I fit in with that segment of brainy, the radiology. But relaxed. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever heard brainy, but relaxed. That's a good one. Well, I think sometimes neuroradiologists have a reputation for being brainy and nitpicky. <laughs> I feel like the head and neck radiologists were a well, little I bit know, less. So. I know you can definitely pick nits and in, in head and neck. There's a lot of anatomy going on in there. So cool. Okay. So talk to us a little bit about what's going on in residency. So one of the things that drew me to your work is you've done a lot of outward communication about what's happening in the residency match. You know, it's been one of the most popular specialties the, the last few years. We'll get into that in a second, but how did you find an interest in this space? You know, you uh, before you even started your work with the residency match, you were on the board of directors of the National Resident Matching Program. What is that program? I think was this was you were, when you were in med school or when you were in, in residency and, and how did that work? Yeah, that was in medical school. So it turns out that the National Resident Matching Program has a board of directors that has representation from all its stakeholders, and that includes medical students. There are three medical students on the board of directors. I think the size of the board of directors is like 15 to 20. So I was nominated through the American Medical Association and medical student section to be on the NRMP board of directors, which I uh, was very excited about because the NRMP for perhaps some of your listeners who are outside the United States, is the matchmaker for medical students who are entering specialty training in residency. And so it's kind of a clearinghouse in which the students put in their preferences about which programs they want to go to and the programs rank which applicants that they prefer. And then the NRMP runs it through an algorithm that spits out where you have to go for residency. And that really sparked my interest in this entire process, the process of transitioning from undergraduate to graduate medical education and the workforce issues that are, are relevant to that. I think 
I still have interest in this whole matching process, even though I'm not directly involved in my day-to-day -day work in resident selection and what have you, because I think it represents the future of the specialty, how competitive your specialty is relative to others in the match and, and how well you're able to recruit students kind of is an indicator of the health of your specialty. So what kind of issues were you guys getting into on this board? So a lot of what the NRMP has to do is kind of control traffic. Um, and so it has to make rules to ensure that the process is fair to all parties. That's you know, the students, the applicants, as well as the programs. In addition, there were always issues about communication and transparency, which I was very interested in because, you know, every year you have tens of thousands of new applicants who are unfamiliar with the process and the NRMP has a role in educating those students on, you know, how you participate in the correct way. And, you know, for instance, to give an example, like the main piece of advice that uh, the NRMP gives to students that you should rank your programs in the order of your true preferences, not based on where you think you have the highest probability of matching, because the algorithm will benefit you if you rank by your true preferences and not because some program director said we're ranking you to match to first or, or what have you. And yeah. so you know, that kind of messaging and putting it out on a website that was usable, putting it on a cell phone app was key or some of the issues that you know we talked about. The other issues were uh, just generating data that is informative to applicants, to program directors, to you know designated institutional officials about the match process. And the statistics are really fascinating to me. So I always look at these statistics um, every year to see how radiology, but also other specialties fall, who's going up and who's going down in terms of number of applicants and what have you, because I think it helps to keep your finger on the pulse of graduate medical education to know like where these specialties are headed in the future. The whole concept that that you're going to be better served by ranking your true preferences versus your probability preferences is probably a bit hard to grok. You know, you wouldn't intuit that that would be the best way to do it. And it's also uh, a very impressive reminder of just how great the match program is. I can't remember. It was a long time ago that that it first came out as an algorithm. And the fact that it's still so powerful today is pretty wild. So it sounds like you're happy as a radiologist to hear about the radiology match. If it was a bellwether for strength uh, in the industry, then this was a banner year. And it's really funny. You and I have a different career paths. I have an MBA. I don't have an MD. Mm -hmm. And they always say that an MBA whatever job the MBAs are going into predicates a crash in said market. So, you know, in, in, in the early 2000s, everyone was going into tech and the 2008s, everyone was going into real estate or whatever it might be. And so whenever the MBAs are going into an industry, it's a crash. Hopefully that's not the case in the radiology match because this was a banner year for radiology. I'll just read some statistics. This year, we saw 2,400 applicants to radiology, which was up 30% versus three years ago. Um, and it's been consistent, 10% a year, every year for the past three years. So a high watermark. We also saw the lowest match ratio in history. Only 80% of people matched in radiology, meaning nearly one in five people did not match. So this is people saying, I want to go into radiology, and they're not getting in. One in five. Now, just a few years ago, this number was 95%, meaning only one in 20 did not match. So a few years ago, you're thinking, hey, I want to go into radiology. That's no problem. For most people now, it's, you know, oh boy, I, I might not get in. I, I got to really focus on my clinicals. I've got to do well on my exams. Um, I might have to do a research year if I don't get in. So what do you make of it? What do you make of all these trends? Yeah, these trends are so fascinating. When I was a medical student and thinking about applying to radiology, it was around 2015, Radiology was at its nadir in terms of competitiveness, and my student affairs dean uh, or, or advising dean was going around saying, hey, you know, what you've heard maybe from your parents about how competitive radiology is no longer true. It's no longer competitive, and so you, you guys are going to get in, no problem. And it was actually kind of troublesome to me. I was like, well, is this the, the downturn of radiology forever for good? Or is it going to turn back up again? Fortunately for me, I, you know, I stuck with it because I believed in the fundamentals of radiology and how it's a good field. And you know, six, seven years later, the job market has turned around. And I think a lot of the turnaround in competitiveness in the residency match 
it is corresponding to how well the job market is at the later end once people have graduated residency and fellowship and looking for jobs because what people say about how hot the job market is does filter down to medical students. I didn't really understand that as a medical student myself, but I, I think the sentiment about the market and the appeal of jobs and the, you know, the, the flexibility of teleradiology and appeal of work from home or you know, the, the number of job offers that graduating fellows are getting these days does trickle down to how you know, residents talk to medical students when advising them about why radiology is great. And I think that does account for a significant portion of the year to year, or I, I guess like, you know, decade to decade fluctuations in how competitive the residency matches. So I think in, in recent years, we've seen this uptick in competitiveness, primarily driven by how well the job market is going. There have been a few years in which there are some up and down perhaps due to worry about how AI is going to affect the field. Um, and there was some uncertainty for that. But I think that was early on during the hype years of radiology. And as realism has set in, that it's not going to be a dramatic like overnight change in radiology. I think more students are catching on to the potential stability that radiology will offer and the flexibility and the appeal of that is um, hitting home for a lot of students. That's interesting. I never thought through what the mechanism is for job prospects to hit, I guess, what, third year med students. So mm -hmm. you're right. It's the residents, most likely not the, you know, people out in practice, but the residents have to somehow have some feeling about the job markets. So maybe they're senior residents. Maybe they've already started to apply to some jobs or uh, they have friends who've graduated and have gone on to certain jobs. They have a certain feel of what's going on. And then they're talking to the med students about the field and saying, oh, well, and here's the types of things you can go do. And it's right. interesting. And it, that, you know, yeah, go it, ahead. It's, yeah, it's like the residents and the fellows who are active on these forums like Student Doctor Network or Reddit or Discord or something like that, places that a lot of students congregate to speculate about the field that perhaps the people who are already in practice aren't privy to as much. Yeah. It's also such a challenging thing because you know, you're a third year med student, you have to speculate about a job market that's eight years out by the time you finish med school, intern year, residency fellowship, the job market could turn, you know, any, yeah. any number of, of ways. And you can't Absolutely. turn so hard with your skill set either. Right. I think it's actually short sighted to base your decision for a specialty based on how hot the job market is. I, I think the influence of the job market is kind of the general sentiment and that colors the conversation. But I think if I were to advise a student about picking a specialty, I would say kind of try to tune out the job market talk, you know, in business speak, look at the fundamentals of the specialty. Like what is it about the day-to-day -day practice of radiology that appeals to you um, that you can envision yourself doing for a whole career of 30 years or more. That's right. And I think that's key. Markets go up, markets go down, but what you have to do every day won't change. And so you know, Taylor always, the advice she always got when she was thinking about specialties was don't think about the best case that you ever saw, you know, on one of your clinical rotations, think about the bread and butter case that you're going to have to do you know, spend 80% of your time on, do you find that interesting? Because if, if you mm -hmm. don't find that interesting, then you're going to get burned out pretty quick on the specialty. And at the end of the day, all the specialties make good enough money to, you know, raise a family and, and achieve your, your needs. So trying to speculate too much about the job prospects is probably not the only lens that I would apply, but right. it has been a booming market. And it's funny because it's a booming market, but as you look, there's so many challenges facing radiology. And so you know, crystal ball looking ahead, like, do you think this trend continues for another five years? What, or if not, like, what's the mechanism that kind of causes people to take a second look and then you start choosing other specialties instead? I think the major challenge is the volume of imaging has outpaced the growth of the number of radiologists. And this translates into more work for each radiologist and pressure to put more hours in or to read faster is a potential recipe for burnout. And I think a lot of people are feeling it um, in radiology. 
especially people who have been in this job longer than I have, who have a longitudinal perspective of how their job is now compared to a decade uh, or more ago is a really dramatic uptick in the productivity demands in clinical radiology. And I think that will continue at least for the short term. And people have been excited about AI you know, for its potential time savings and efficiency, but nobody knows when that will hit really, realistically speaking. Um, people have been talking about it for many years. There are a huge number of applications now available, but the uptake of that has been slow for good reasons. And how to calibrate exactly the rise in demand in imaging versus how many radiologists you're training every year versus the potential productivity, you know, efficiency gains from computer applications is very difficult for the field to manage because there's no central body that's uh, kind of titrating all of these factors at once. It's kind of uh, uh, things will change dynamically over the years. So what do you think the causal mechanism of burnout impacting the radiology matches. One thing I could think about is like, okay, you know, a lot of people choose not to go into surgery because the hours are just too much. You get to wake up early, you got a lot of call. And, you know, if you want to raise family and have other interests, it's just not tenable. But with radiology, you can like kind of just choose your schedule these days. And so even if you're burning out during the hours that you're working, you could take one of these three day a week teleradiology jobs and dial it back. So I'm trying to figure out how the burnout ends up scaring people off. Maybe those part-time jobs go away. Maybe people say, no, you know, if you're going to work for us, you need to work six days a week and, you know, hit certain RBU targets and we're not going to pay someone to work half time. But right now, people will take any radiology hours they can get on their staff. So I don't know. Right, right. I think burnout can affect the operations of radiology practice in a lot of different ways. But specifically as to your question of how it can affect the radiology match and interest in radiology, I think when students are taking the radiology elective uh, and they're essentially shadowing, like they're very observant. They're they're mm. looking at how much do people enjoy their job, right? And it, it's difficult to make a conclusion based off just a snippet of the day, but you can get that based on, you know, how much enthusiasm uh, the attendings or the residents are bringing to readouts, um, how much downtime it seems that people have between cases. Do you have time to check your email or are you like literally so glued to your seat that you don't have time to go to the bathroom and you don't have time to talk to the medical students or they're kind of relegated to the corner of the room or something like that. And I think people have to think about that when you're devising like a clinical clerkship or an elective and you're putting these medical students on these services that are, you know, you have to think about whether it's overly busy, whether there's the right teachers um, and uh, residents on that service who will you know, provide an accurate representation of how good the field is and how positive the day-to-day -day work can be. I think about that when uh, I think too, like when I was choosing neuroradiology as a radiology resident, in our early years in residency, we are kind of sequestered into one part of the reading room, whereas uh, the fellows were manning the front door because they would get in the walk-in consults, they would get the phone calls asking for help. And then um, all these other people were doing tumor boards. So I initially thought of neuroradiology as a very secluded field. Uh, you know, my perception as a medical student was, well, well, the neurology residents and the neurosurgeons, they can all look at their own imaging. They don't need to ask the opinion of the neuroradiologist. And it wasn't until later on in residency when I had the opportunity to attend these tumor boards to observe the in-person consoles, the telephone consoles that were occurring just constantly uh, every day that I really realized how interconnected neuroradiology was with the rest of the hospital and the value that neuroradiologists provide. And so too, I think it's important to expose students to these interactions because I, I think um, the ability to provide value and be valued at your work is I think a huge part in preventing burnout. Well said. Switching gears a bit, you wrote a paper on virtual fellowship recruiting. So for those who did interviews a long time ago, uh, they probably got on a plane, flew to five or 10 different fellowship locations and you know had full interview days where they got to meet everybody. Um, same for residency. A lot of this has moved virtual. 
there's some benefits of virtual. It's a lot cheaper. It's a lot easier to fit in with your busy work life. Um, but there's also some cons, you know, A, it's hard to really build a connection with people over Zoom in the same way that you can in person. And B, you know, you don't get to, to have a real feel for a place and a feel for its people virtually. So I'm kind of curious where you net out on virtual recruiting. I know your paper was on fellowship recruiting, but, you know, it's also really important for residency recruiting. What's your take? Yeah, I think that virtual recruiting is probably going to be here to stay. I think it's just so much more convenient for all parties involved to uh, have at least the initial stage be a virtual recruitment. And there may be ways um, in the future or are now being implemented kind of a hybrid way that for those people who want to take a second look in person, and that's critical to their decision making that they have the ability to do that, but they should be allowed the ability to take a second look without that affecting their ranking on the programs list. So, you know, one way to implement this would be, you know, the program rank list is already made by the time the second look event takes place so that, you know, whether you attend the second look or not um, does not influence the program's ranking of you, but it can only help you determine where the program ranks on the applicant's uh, own rank order list. So I, I think there is a way future that kind of preserves the efficiency, the cost savings uh, for both applicants and programs in a in a virtual environment, but still allows the possibility of in-person visits that, you know, provides the information that applicants want in uh, determining where they want to rank a certain program. And this applies to, you know, fellowships, to residencies, and even medical schools. So this past year, I've been involved with the um, MD admissions committee, uh, at Hopkins, and we did all our interviews uh, virtually. And this is really convenient for me because I could do it from my home office. And these college students, these applicants could stay at home wherever they were. Sometimes they're overseas doing some research fellowship or what have you. It's really convenient for everybody. And then at, at the end, you know, once they're accepted, they could have a second look uh, weekend where they see the physical campus and they meet their potential future peers, which I think are important aspects of that decision-making process. I really love that idea. That's the first I've heard of that one. And I think kind of going back to the match thing, which is about at the end of the day, it's about how do I find my own personal preferences. And so if you can help me find my own personal preferences, whatever the way that might be, and and then I have that option without it impacting me, seems like a really great way to have your cake and eat it too. I've been really old school in my opinions on this in particular, because I just think about my wife and I's experience going through the match and she and I were hell bent on going to New York, really wanted to go to New York for a variety of reasons, social family, my career, things like that. And she got an interview at Penn and she took the interview and then she went to Philly and neither of us had ever been to Philly. And she's like, Daniel, like I really liked Penn. Like, I don't know something about it, the people, the, the facilities, whatever, just everyone seemed to really love their job. Like it, it was really great. And by the way, like Philly, it turns out it's a cool city. I didn't know, but it's really, you know, there's good restaurants, it's really dense. There's a lot going on. And so I was like, oh, I had no idea. And then we went to Philadelphia and kind of fell in love and went for it. And I just don't think that would have happened in a virtual world. I just don't. I think we were, you know, super focused on New York. We did our interviews in New York and we just would have ranked the New York programs had we not had that in-person experience that really shaped our view on it. So I'm informed by that personal experience. I recognize there's a ton of dead weight loss on the other side of that. And so trying to find a way to both gain some efficiency, but also enable that serendipity is appealing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And on the flip side too, um, I think virtual interviewing enables people to interview at more places. And so perhaps a program that wasn't even really on your radar uh, becomes on your radar and you know that leads you down a very different pathway in your life um, because you might've turned it down because it, you'd have to fly across the country and it's inconvenient. You have to take two days off from your work or what have you, or, or from school. Uh, but now it's just one day it's virtual and you can meet people that are at an institution that you hadn't previously considered, but that are very appealing and um, great to work with. And then, you know, the love of the city will come after that. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, you know, you mentioned a lot of your research is in the area of education. You and I have something in common is that we both hate textbooks. Neither of us have found textbooks to be a particularly effective way to learn. This was, you know, part of my motivation to build modality, simulation training, video-based, highly interactive kind of ways to learn. 
one thing it sounds like you've been pretty optimistic about is AI in education. Talk to me a little bit about that. How do you see AI impacting radiology education? Yeah, I, I think a couple of potential ways AI could impact radiology education. So recently, the talk of the town has been chat GPT. So, so more broadly, large language models, which are these AI programs that you train on a large corpus of text, and it kind of learns how to predict the next words, the next sentences that come after a, a given text. And it's kind of a synthesis of the knowledge that is input here. And what people have found in radiology, we had a podcast come out today about two papers coming out in the journal radiology about benchmarking chat GPT on radiology content is how well does it know radiology, at least from a text only based perspective, even though it has not been trained specifically on radiology content. And tools like chat GPT, I think have a potential role in information finding, particularly for learners. I think it's not yet ready at that point where you can use ChatGPT as a Google or a StatDX or a Radiopedia or what have you. But I think in the future, once it gets better, that it will be like a tab that's always open on your reading workstation. And if you have a question about, you know, what causes this artifact I'm seeing, or what is the differential for a hypervascular mass in the adrenal gland or something like that, that typing it into a chat bot rather than going to a traditional search engine or a traditional website will often be more efficient than, you know, trying to find the information yourself. And you can ask it to dumb it down, to make it more sophisticated, to summarize uh, or to elaborate on any given text. And in that way, you kind of have a personal tutor in a sense that's, you know, connected to the internet or, or connected at least to a large corpus of knowledge that you can kind of query on demand, you know, without having to you know, bother a human being basically about learning some, you know, fundamental things in radiology, I think. So what, I think we're going to see more of that in the future. Um, the, the second way that I think AI could impact radiology education in particular is to have more simulation based training. And so what I mean is like the traditional way to train in radiology is like in much of medicine, you see one, you do one, you teach one. So you see one case example of a subdural hematoma, and then you're kind of expected to extrapolate that appearance in your mind to all future cases. And you are now expected to be able to detect all subdural hematomas, but we know that is not true. Like we have blind spots and that if you've never seen a case of an isolated subdural hematoma along the tentorium, which separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum, that you may not know to look there. Um, and that until you've seen a case example of that, that that is going to be a blind spot for you. And so what the traditional model of teaching is kind of serendipitous. Whatever comes across the clinical work list is what you're going to read. And if you never see a tentorial subdural hematoma, you may not ever realize that that is a blind spot for you. I think the future of radiology education will be more deliberate, more deliberate in structuring at least early radiology education to broad, deliberate exposure to a diversity of pathologies with repetition, repetition so that it can adapt to the weaknesses of the learner. And this is where I think kind of predictive modeling and AI can come in. It's like uh, if you show a bunch of radiology residents, different residents will have different weaknesses and different blind spots, and you won't know which blind spots they have until you kind of test them repeatedly with a lot of examples of the same pathology and what have you. So I, I think there's going to be more in the future from the buzzwords are deliberate practice, simulation, adaptive learning, and then all of these, I think AI will play a role in that. Really interesting. Both of those ideas are are great. We've been thinking a lot about the first use case around the chat GPT and this kind of aggregated point of care search kind of integrated right into the workflow is, is really interesting. You know, Khan Academy, they just came out with a talk last week about how they're thinking about AI. And you, you mentioned personalized tutor. The way they're thinking about personalized tutor is, you know, they, they ask you a math question, some hard math question on their app. And you don't know what the answer is. So you ask the chatbot, tell me the answer. And the chatbot says, look, I'm, I'm not going to tell you the answer, but I'll tell you how to think about the answer. Have you thought about, 
you know, how you might isolate this variable. And says, I don't know how to isolate a variable. Okay, well, here's how you isolate a variable. And then it walks you through. And it's all like as if you were talking to a tutor, but a, a very compassionate tutor that is using the Socratic method to work through this math problem with you. You can imagine the same thing in radiology where I see something here, but I don't know what it is. Okay, well, maybe describe it to me. What are you seeing? Okay, mm -hmm. well, based on those descriptions, what are the things that it could be? And it could just be talking to you as if it's an attending sitting right there at the workstation with you, helping you solve the problem. So this idea of this personalized tutor kind of integrated into the simulation is pretty fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I can totally imagine you're querying the chatbot. The chatbot is asking you, so what organ did it arise from? Or the signal characteristics on T1 or T2? Does the patient have a history of cancer? These are all the things that you should be thinking through as you're reasoning through a differential diagnosis for this lesion. Um, I think that would be awesome. Yeah. So sounds like you're more bullish about AI in education than maybe in clinical service. In your service at Hopkins, like what percent of your studies are, are utilizing AI today? In neuroradiology, very little. I think the only application we have deployed is RAPID. And uh, they have a large vessel occlusion detector. So on a CTA, CT angiogram for stroke, uh, it will detect the occlusion of the internal carotid artery or, or the middle cerebral artery. There are many other applications out there on the market. We, we just haven't found the business case for implementing yeah. them. Yeah. And what is that? Is that sub 5% of your volume? Yeah, I'd, I actually don't know the percentage, but it, it would not surprise me if it were in single digit percentages. Um, yeah. It's just so interesting, kind of, we sit here May 23rd of 2023, article just came out in the Imaging Wire, which is a popular radiology website, shout out to them, they're great if you're not a subscriber, and over $5 billion have been invested in AI for medical imaging to date, and so when you think of Hopkins, as, like if it's not being done at Hopkins, it's probably not being done kind of place, they're, they're pretty cutting edge, and so I think that would surprise many people not in radiology to hear. Yeah, I think it's not um, exclusive to Hopkins either. Uh, we just had a grand round speaker come from Stanford, who is a thought leader in AI and radiology. But for him, too, their department has only implemented a couple of programs that use AI for uh, radiology interpretation, like you know segmentation of the ventricles on a cardiac MRI or the stroke imaging kind of triage tools that I mentioned mammography, computer-aided detection, which has been around for a while, but not necessarily using the deep learning that people are working on today. Those few examples are basically it. Yeah. So you're just finishing up your first year at Hopkins, one year into life as an attending. Congrats on on making it. What, what, uh, what was better than you expected? What was uh, more challenging? That's an interesting question. I, I think Probably better than I expected were was the community of colleagues that I have. Shout out to them. They have been, you know, really welcoming. And I think in the era of uh, kind of doing a lot of remote work or working at multiple sites, because people have to cover different sites, they've done a lot in maintaining a culture of uh, good communication through uh, Microsoft Teams and, you know, sharing cases with each other and, um, you know, helping each other on difficult cases while sharing interesting cases and giving each other kudos for accomplishments and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's a great working environment to be in um, and, you know, something difficult to gauge when you're interviewing at different places, like what is the work culture and the, the culture of interaction between colleagues? What was more challenging? I would say probably uh, saying no to things. I didn't imagine the number of opportunities that would come your way as a junior attending, like people are inviting you to write chapters or moderate panels or give educational talks, especially if I put myself out there um, as a, a new attending who's interested in education, you know, I want to give talks because that's a big part of my portfolio. That's how I kind of brand myself on Twitter as a radiology educator, then the opportunities are going to come your way, but there's not enough time to do everything. And um, at some point you have to say no. Um, and hopefully that doesn't burn any bridges or um, turn people away irreversibly. And hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll still have time to work together or you know, take on those opportunities. But a lot of people have advised me that a big challenge of being a junior attending is knowing when to say no and knowing when to say heck yes. <laughs> you mentioned Twitter. You tweet a lot. 
why what drew you to twitter what motivates you to kind of be online because you know it's not just twitter too you have a podcast at the rsna definitely check that out um you teach on radiopedia soon you're going to be teaching on modality so it doesn't seem like you're saying no a lot but maybe there's a, a through <laughs> line uh to some of the stuff that you're doing online yeah so i started on twitter when i was a medical student applying into radiology and that was at a time where the common advice the common practice was to delete all your social media because you don't want programs learning about what you do on social media but i thought it was a great opportunity to put yourself out there and to interact with people that you wouldn't otherwise interact with um, in real life what drew me to twitter is really how it flattens hierarchy it democratizes the production and sharing of knowledge no longer is you know learning uh, or the machinations of organizations locked up behind you know boardrooms. Like people put it out there on Twitter. People have conversations about policies, about educational techniques, like everything you can name of. So the information is like really free flowing. So just to share an anecdote of how you know this worked out well for me, even as a medical student applying into radiology. I was interacting with chairs of radiology on Twitter. And I was like, you know, engaging them in conversation, replying to what they were talking about because I was interested in what they were talking about. And uh, one time I ended up interviewing with one of these people in real life and they brought up a conversation we previously had. So it was an instant icebreaker to this interview that was only facilitated by our prior interactions on Twitter. These days, I often advise medical students and residents to get out there on Twitter, number one, because there's a lot to learn. Uh, I, I think I learned so much about radiology through following my radiology colleagues, but also my surgical colleagues or neurology colleagues on Twitter, that interaction wouldn't happen in real life normally. And I, I learn a lot from them. Number two, it allows you to make connections that you know you wouldn't otherwise make unless you were going to national meetings and serving on committees with all these people that I know the names of you know, many different people across the country at, in my field, uh, only because I follow them on Twitter and they follow me back and we interact uh, on an occasional basis over things of shared interest. It's a really great lesson. I think people probably overestimate how competitive it is to build a brand in a niche on Twitter. There's an old stat that people like to talk about, which is basically... 90% of people just consume on social media, 90% of people like or comment, and then 1% tweet. So if you think about that, very few people are actually creating content, but you know, the, the Twitter gods, uh, now just a one Twitter god, sadly, you know, they they need content in order to keep the flywheel moving. And so you can get real distribution and connection. And so, but then I guess the flip side is then people think, oh, well, I don't have anything to say, or, you know, I don't, I don't have an opinion that's worthwhile. And I think that just takes time. Like anything in life, you just, you start. And once you start, you, you learn and iterate and figure out what are the things that you like talking about and what are the things you find interesting. So yeah, the, yeah. the barrier is less high than I think people think. Yeah. I think there's some activation energy to writing your first tweet. Um, because you don't have any followers. But once you generate enough content, the followers will come naturally. I think you don't have to worry about getting followers per se. You just write about what interests you, what you're reading, you know, what paper in the literature you found interesting and may potentially change your practice or a difficult case that you came upon recently and you want to solicit other people's opinions about, you know, how they would have managed it or something like that. I think there are a lot of opportunities for engagement on Twitter you know, I even have a, like a separate account for head and neck radiology content. It's at head and neck rads. So I just post things that I think are interesting when I come upon them in the literature, or if I have a interesting case and I wanted to make a teaching point to my resident, you know, I'll tell my resident, but in the back of my mind, I'll think, you know, this would be a great teaching point to make to the whole world through Twitter. If I have a couple thousand followers on this account and, you know, a couple hundred of them can learn something from this tweet, I'll just take the extra effort to post this on Twitter as well. So I think for people who are into education, I think it's a great platform to get your name out there, but also to really make an impact on people's education, you know, not locked up behind a paywall and not, you know, buried in the pages of a textbook that nobody will ever read. <laughs> yeah. 
we'll see how much longer it's not locked up behind a paywall. The future of Twitter <laughs> is, uh, is, is uncertain. Well, last question for you. What advice do you have for your peers, your you know, slightly younger radiologist entering the field today, especially anyone that's maybe interested in academics? Yeah, I think choosing academics comes down to choosing a line of work that you have to do a lot of different things. Uh, you have to enjoy all those different things as well. But um, I think variety is the spice of life. And so having the privilege of teaching residents and fellows while doing clinical work, but also um, having the time or incentive to engage in academic work that might be writing papers and putting together educational talks um, has to be really appealing to you. But if it is, I, I think academic career is perfect and you'll derive a lot of satisfaction from that. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Francis Dang, for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. That was a lot of fun. My pleasure, Daniel. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Radiology Report podcast. Be sure to visit us at the radiologyreportpodcast.com or subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts to join us for our next episode. We are always looking for great guests. If you have someone you'd like to hear on the show, please get in touch with us online.